My name is Vivian Hernandez Trujillo, and I am representing the Immune Deficiency Physician Advisory Committee, along with Dr. Kate Sullivan. Hi, my name is Kate Sullivan, and I'm here today with my colleague, Vivian Hernandez Trujillo, who has been doing the Spanish language translations of these videos. I'm really honored and delighted to partner with her today on this video, which is an update on the recent developments in vaccines for COVID-19. The date of this video is November 25th of 2020, and you will understand that this is a very rapidly changing story, and we hope to provide you more videos going forward. It helps to understand these vaccines by just spending a minute and talking about how vaccines work in general. So the general approach to vaccines is that they in some way imitate the real infection. And they do this in different ways with different technologies. But the idea is that rather than getting the infection, which can be deadly, the vaccine imitates the infection to induce an immune response. And there's two components to this. Vivian is gonna talk about this later, but it's important to recognize that there are two components. The one that everyone talks about is making antibodies. Does the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine induce sufficient antibody to be protective? And that's because antibodies are our shield from getting the infection. But there's actually another component to the immune response to all vaccines that we don't talk about as much, and that is the T cell aspect. And T cells actually work to contain a viral infection once you are already infected. And so these T cells kick into action after the infection, but a pre-primed T cell, one that has been activated previously by a vaccine, is going to be more effective. And so at least in animal models, there is evidence that having a primed T cell response as a result of a vaccine can mitigate severity of infection even when there's no antibodies to put up that shield. So the two vaccines that have been most talked about in the news because they're the first to make it most likely to emergency authorization by the FDA in the US are RNA-based vaccines. Now this is not a technology that's been used in any mass vaccination program before, so you might be interested to learn how they work. They are unusual in that they are basically giving instructions to our bodies to make this imitation infection so that we can mount an immune response. It sounds a little bit indirect, but actually it's very effective. I think more effective than any one guest. There are other vaccines that are coming down the pike. They use a different technology. You might have heard of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. This is an adenovirus vaccine. It is a viral vector, but it doesn't replicate, so it's not a danger to people with immune deficiencies. And it also um, is an imitation infection designed to induce immunity to SARS-CoV-2. Another question you might have is, how is this vaccine going to be administered? And there's really two aspects to this. One is, it's just an injection like any other vaccine. There is one vaccine candidate that is administered by a kind of, I hate to use the term gun, but it is not one of the ones that's likely to get authorization right away. All the rest are administered using a syringe. It's a simple injection like any other vaccine you've ever seen. But the more complicated part is how is it going to be rolled out to the community? And boy, has this been a source of speculation. The CDC just released their playbook, and in their playbook, they made it clear that each state is going to have autonomy in how they distribute it. So the playbook offers some general guidance, and there are aspects that are unique to each vaccine. So one vaccine requires a very special freezer, one vaccine requires refrigeration only, and one is somewhere in between. So there are aspects that are specific to each vaccine, but the CDC has given the states very broad leeway in determining which populations will get the vaccine first. In some cases, cities also have specific um, playbooks that they're going to use to figure out how to roll out the vaccine. So since I'm in Philadelphia, I will just compare and contrast 
Philadelphia versus Pennsylvania's plans for rolling out the vaccine. So in general, all states are asked to define first responders, healthcare workers, and special vulnerable populations, which in some cases has been taken to mean the elderly in nursing homes, and in other places they have determined that to be people over age 65. So the first group to get the vaccine is very broadly healthcare workers, first, first responders, essential workers, like people who pick up the garbage, people who work in grocery stores, and vulnerable people. But the reality is that there will be tiers within that first phase. In the second phase, it's other vulnerable people, which certainly would include people with immune deficiencies, and some states may make the determination that people with immune deficiencies are in phase one. It's up to each state how they determine that. And then finally in phase three, everybody gets it. How might this happen? This would take place over months. It's not going to be instantaneous, but if the vaccine makers are as able to generate vaccine as they say they are, it would be theoretically possible to vaccinate everyone in the U.S. who wants it by summertime. That's perhaps a little optimistic, but there is at least the theoretical possibility to do that. There's one other option I wanna talk about, and it's not exactly a vaccine. It's called passive immunity. So there are three companies that are making various types of antibody. They made these products as a treatment for acute COVID-19, but one company is now trying to use these antibodies as a preventive strategy, much like many people use IVIG or subcutaneous immunoglobulin to prevent infections, but this would be disease specific. And so it would be particularly valuable for people who have antibody deficiencies and can't mount an antibody response to the vaccine or to people in especially high risk settings. For example, someone in an elderly care home gets infected and they want to provide protection for all the inhabitants of that care home so that they don't get infected. So there are these three products, they're in various stages of testing. Two of them were initially tested as acute treatment but could be repurposed in a preventive strategy. One is being tested as a preventive strategy. So I think that offers a little bit of a safety net but it's unclear when those would get FDA approval and how, um, how they might be utilized in real life. The next question is, are they safe for people with immune deficiencies? The vaccine, as you've likely heard, will be the fastest to market in the history of vaccines. We expect that the vaccine will be approved by the FDA when they feel there is sufficient evidence that the vaccine is safe and works well to help the body's immune system respond by producing antibodies to protect the patient. The vaccine will not be live. This means that patients with PI do not need to be concerned that the vaccine is live and can give them the disease. We understand that there may be concern over the safety and it is likely that highest risk groups such as healthcare workers and first responders will be among the first to receive the vaccines. General distribution and availability to other adults will likely follow. The next question is, will they work for people with immune deficiencies? This is an excellent question. Vaccines help the immune system to respond by producing antibodies that help protect the patient over time. We expect that patients that do not have deficiency in antibody production will be able to respond to the vaccine. One important thing to keep in mind is that vaccines elicit an immune response by cells to protect the body in ways apart from the antibody production. This may protect patients with primary immunodeficiency, in particular, antibody deficiency. So even those with difficulty producing antibodies may have some protection. Similar examples are when we as immunologists recommend administration of a yearly influenza vaccine to protect our patients with primary immunodeficiency, even those with antibody deficiency. The next question is, will children be able to receive the vaccine? 
As a pediatric immunologist, this is near and dear to my heart. As with other vaccines or medications, studies are performed in adults first to determine if the vaccine is safe and if it works. Since this vaccine has been fast-tracked, it's possible that studies in children and ultimately approval to use in children will occur after it is used in adults for a period of time. We do anticipate that the vaccine will be available to give to children, but it is not possible at this time to give an estimate as to when it may be available. While you may hear at times that children are not at risk of complications due to infection with SARS-CoV-2, that is unfortunately not true. Children can be infected, many children have been infected, and beyond being asymptomatic carriers, which many children are, some children can get very sick from infection with SARS-CoV-2, and some have died. Reports of a complication from the infection, known as MISC, can lead to widespread inflammation a few weeks after the infection. Last week, the AAP said that children should be included in trials testing coronavirus vaccine candidates as early as possible. For this reason, once the vaccine is approved in children, consider the vaccine for your child. As a mother, my daughters will receive the vaccine. Thank you all for your attention. Stay healthy and be safe. As Vivian said, stay well, be safe, and know that things are changing rapidly for the better. I can be more optimistic than I have been before, and so I wish you um, safeness and healthiness until we see the end of this pandemic.